All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on the research I did um, um, last year um, at the Cape Luther Institute. And I'd just like to say it was an awesome experience, and um, there was a lot to be learned, and you know, there's a, still a lot, to work, a lot of work to be done. So ankyline pond, so the word ankyline is from the Greek word ankylos, which means um, near the sea. So these are landlocked bodies of water that are located near the coast. Um, they have subterranean connections to the ocean, um, and they do have tidal fluctuations, so they go up and down with the tides. Um, they're also found in places with volcanic or limestone rock, such as places like Me uh, Mexico, Hawaii, Palau, and obviously the Bahamas. So one unique feature of uh, these ponds is that they, um, they are a habitat for unique organisms that have been isolated from their oceanic counterparts, um, leading to unique evolutionary populations that are sometimes endemic to these ponds. However, there is very little data on these ponds. So their um, pond research or ankyline pond research is very new. So um, the data isn't quite theirs yet. Um, and especially for Eleuthera, so um, it's, still, it's a lot of work to be done. So together with the Island School um, semesters of spring 2015 and fall 2015, we set out to explore these ponds. So the purpose of our study was to um, explore these ponds, um, assess the ankyline ponds of Eleuthera, specifically to identify sites with endemic species, and to determine the extent of human disturbances to prioritize sites for conservation. So for our methods, um, so what we do first is we would actually locate these ponds um, using Google Earth. Um, these are some examples of the ponds um, that we've been to. And after we found, um, found them on Google Earth, we would actually have to bushwhack our way um, most times to actually get to these ponds because most of them um, probably have never seen people, um, seen human activity around them in such a long time. So once we arrive at these ponds, we carry out a variety of um, chemical testing. So we look for um, dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, and also nitrates, phosphates, and also ammonia. So to better understand the physical um, characteristics of these ponds, we would actually have the Island School students. And right here, you can actually see Andrika Burroughs, who's um, one of the best scholars for, um, for that semester. So they went around the, um, went around the pond on a paddleboard. Um, they used a GPS to mark waypoints. And they used a depth sounder to um, create these, um, these bathymetry maps. So basically, it shows you um, the depth of the ponds and how they're structured. And lastly, for our biological surveys, we would, use, we would deploy beta remote underwater video surveillance to look at cryptic species and basically anything that was in the pond. So as a result, we were actually able to um, get to 17 sites. However, what was actually pretty concerning is that um, out of those 17 sites, 11 of them um, have been impacted. So they have been impacted by, um, by either one or more of these um, ecological threats, such as pollution, um, dumping, a lot of the um, trash going into these systems, um, accessibility to landowners, which allows a lot of runoff to get into these ponds. And um, one of the most worrying is introduced species. So these species actually have, a, um, have the potential to wipe out um, native organisms to these ponds. And one of the things that we noticed on our exploration of these ponds is that um, Nassau grouper and um, schoolmaster snappers were the most common uh, fish in these ponds. So uh, we would actually talk to um, locals about um, these ponds because they were on, some, um, on people's property. And they would tell us that they would actually stock these ponds with these fish. And one of the um, things we also noticed is that they would tell us, oh, yeah, there were you know, certain fish in there before we put, you know, the grouper and the snapper there, but now, you know, they're gone. We don't know why. So, so that's one thing that we were um, concerned about. Um, and seven, um, seven out of the 17 sites um, contained, um, contained species that were of interest. 
which, um, which include, but not limited to, um, endangered red cave shrimp. So just like, the, um, just like anchor line ponds, there's very little information on these shrimp. There's only a handful of papers actually talking about um, these red cave shrimp, mostly coming from Hawaii and Palau and um, a few other places. And, and that data deficiency um, led me to, um, to actually uh, do a behavioral study um, under the guidance of um, Dr. Jocelyn Curtis Quick at CEI um, with the purpose of to assess their behavior of the potentially new and endangered species of cave shrimp. So the objective of my, um, of my study was to create an, um, an ethogram of the cave shrimp behaviors um, essentially to use in future projects and also to compare behavioral differences between the ponds with and without potential fish predators. So for my experiment, I, um, I chose two sites. So the first site was Red Shrimp Pond and so this is a rough video from the pond, and as you can see, there's a whole, there's a you know whole heap and help of um, these shrimp, um, you know, just enjoying their time uh, because there is no predators in these ponds. Just like um, Sweeting's pond with the seahorses, this is the same case for Red Shrimp Pond. And my second site was Cotton Bay Pond. So as you can see, yeah, there's these um, little ravenous fish, which. Um, they make quick work of a lot of um, things that, you know, that end up dying or uh, whatever have you. So this is um, the second pond with the potential fish predators to the shrimp. So for my um, observations, um, what I would do is I would actually um, record their position, whether they're hiding in, um, whether they're hiding or they're out in the open in the tanks every two minutes. And I also take note of um, their behavior and the coloration of the shrimp because these shrimp are actually known to change colors so they would go from bright red um, during the day and ghostly white at, um, when it's pitch black at night. So just, uh, just so you can get an uh, idea of how the tank looks or how it's set up, so each tank, each 60 gallon tank would be um, outfitted with these two rock refuges, so basically given a place for the shrimp to hide um, similar to their native habitat. Um, each shrimp, so three shrimps were used for each trial. So for instance, this is the control trial um, during the daytime, and three shrimp would be um, used during this time, and they would acclimate for an, at least an hour before observations actually began. So during the nighttime, thanks to Dr. Mason Jones for lending me her um, GoPro light. Um, so, to, so the problem of doing nighttime surveys is that we don't want to use regular lights to actually um, view the fish just because it would um, disrupt their normal behavior. So what, um, what, was decided, what I decided to do was use a red film over the, over the light to reduce um, the disturbance. And, uh, fish and other sea creatures aren't, um, they're not going to really see that red light. So for the fish treatment, I would actually use two schoolmaster snappers just because it was the most common fish that we found in these ponds. And we would, I would place them in a transparent um, jar, I mean pretty much a mayonnaise jar with um, holes on the top to allow water in and out of the jar. And the fish would also be allowed to acclimate for an hour along with the shrimp. So, um, so the results, um, as you can see here, I divided it by the treatment. So this is showing you the average shrimp um, in hiding during the observation. So I divided it um, between the fish treatment and the control, and I also divided it um, between the, the site and um, the time of day. And as you can see here, there is, um, there is somewhat of a difference between the daytime um, the daytime observations and the nighttime observations. So, I was, um, so we ran a three-way ANOVA um, on the data and we determined that there was a significant difference between the treatments but not between um, said sites or, um, or time of day. Um, um, 
or the p-value, we found that it was um, quite significant. So for the means, uh, 2.3 shrimp uh, were hiding in the control treatment, while 2.7 shrimp were hiding in the fish treatment. So we found this to be um, uh, um, quite significant. So in conclusion, um, shrimp, um, shrimp hide more in the presence of predators, which seems like a um, more natural response. So in this picture, you'll see the shrimp um, somewhat on the outside and the inside. Um, uh, also, this, so this would mean um, even though they had hide more during the, um, in the presence of fish, um, this still um, raises a lot of questions in terms of people stalking ponds and whether or not it's a really healthy practice because even though they hide more, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would adapt fast enough for these, um, to these new predators. Because we have, um, again, we've heard a lot of stories where fishermen would, you know, stock their ponds with groupers, snappers, barracudas, all um, sorts of um, different oceanic species. And then uh, we'd ask them about the stuff that was there before, and they're like, no, we haven't, you know, seen them in ages. So we believe that either um, they're all eaten out or they were um, driven back more into their um, subterranean connections. Also, there is a lot more data um, needed. So while we're doing this study, um, we actually found that there's two species of shrimp on, on Luther that are morphologically distinct. So um, the first species we have here is the Cuban cave shrimp, um, Barbaria cubensis, and the second one is the Sturz cave shrimp, um, Parahippolite um, steri. And this would actually be one of the first um, cases where they have actually been found on this, um, on this island. So um, previously, they weren't known to be on Eleuthera, but now, but now that we have actually have the, um, the genetic data, we know that um, they're on this island. So this is another um, you know, good report. Um, again, so we need a lot more data. So we studied 17 sites within the study. But there, we've actually found there's about 200 plus ponds on Eleuthera like the ones that um, were studied like Red Shrimp Pond and Cotton Bay um, Pond and Sweetings Pond. So there's a lot more work to be done um, in terms of the conservation, um, conservation of these ponds as well because um, there's very little data on them. And, but at the same time, they're still being impacted um, by um, human development. So... Um, the take-home message for this is we have to know what we have first before we can actually move forward um, with any sort of development so that we don't destroy anything that we don't even, um, don't even have a clue about. All right. So with that, um, these are my citations. And I would just like to acknowledge the Island School and the Cape Luther Institute for allowing me to do this project. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Um, Jocelyn and Aaron for helping me with this project and guiding me through the process. Um, Rob Ditter from the Florida International University as a collaborator, Dr. Um, Kathleen Seeley um, for her advice, um, the Inland Ponds class of um, spring and fall 2015, and also the interns of um, Cape, the Cape Luther Institute. And with that, um, are there any questions or comments?